And uh, we talked last week about it. We talked the week before about it. So we've talked three weeks in a row about the Ukrainian counteroffensive. And every week it's the same. Doesn't seem like anything's happening there. Uh, let's get that. For some reason, the tweet itself is like very small. Um, but basically, what I'm saying, what I'm showing here is what Ukraine's counteroffense has been going for about two weeks, supposedly. This is showtime. The U.S. has been pushing Ukraine to do this. They don't quite have the equipment that they say they need, or maybe they have too much of a kind of equipment that they should have never had. And the Institute for the Study of War, which is an arms industry funded think tank in Washington that has been providing all the updates for the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Daily, produced this update, which contained a very interesting tidbit that for some reason, the legacy publications in the US didn't want to touch. And it's that uh, Ukrainian forces may be temporarily pausing counteroffensive operations to reevaluate their tactics for future operations. Hmm, it's 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 kind of like uh, you know, two weeks to flatten the curve. Now it's like uh, two weeks to get through the outer ring of Russian defenses and try to push uh, towards the uh, the land bridge, the, the Crimean land bridge. It's kind of kind of reminds me of March 2020 for some reason. And, you know, if the Institute for Study of War is acknowledging this, it's not very good for you. This group, by the way, is run by Kimberly Kagan. She is the sister of Robert Kagan, who is the husband of Victoria Newland, who is the former chief of staff to Dick Cheney. So you get the point. It's not looking good for the Ukrainians. And then we even have CNN, Jim Shudo, by the, who, by the way, was the former chief of staff <clears throat> to... Gary Locke, who is the ambassador to China. So basically, Jim Shudo interrupted his journalistic career for two years under Obama to work in the U.S. embassy in Beijing. That's how connected he is to the State Department. And I guess you could probably deduce U.S. intelligence in the military. We have a totally different, well, yeah, early, early stages of the Ukrainian counteroffensive are having far less success and Russian forces are showing more competence than Western assessments expected, say, all of the officials that Jim Shudo serves as a stenographer for. Um, but they're optimistic long-term. <laughs> I mean, it's important to highlight these sources because these are the cheerleaders who have pushed Ukraine to this point. Jim Shudo has been one of the biggest cheerleaders for this military, the whole military operation. And it's important here to, dis to, to look back to the so-called Kharkiv counteroffensive where Ukraine took a swath of territory around Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine and gave this, injected this confidence, and I would say hubris, into the chattering classes in Washington, the Ann Applebaums who serve as the cheerleaders of this war, and I would say the, the Pentagon itself. But what actually happened there was Ukraine was taking advantage of its partnership with the U.S. U.S. geospatial intelligence uh, to assess where the Russian weak spots were. And Russia had been guarding their position in Kharkiv with just a small, uh, a small attachment of tactical police officers, basically SWAT, a SWAT team yeah. who were not heavily outfitted. They were outnumbered and they organized uh, immediate retreat did not lose that many soldiers. And then Russia began positioning its forces on the, as they did after Kherson, they, they continued to position their forces and harden their uh, defenses on the left bank of the Dnipro River. But in the US, there was this sense, and I mean, you got it in Washington, the sense that Ukraine could actually mount a much larger counteroffensive based on these previous successes. But what they're doing is totally different. They're not actually able to take advantage of Russian weaknesses because Russia is so heavily entrenched that there really aren't them, aren't, aren't weaknesses. And they're running right into the teeth of Russian artillery, Russian minefields, and Russian anti-tank weapons. And they're also facing Russian air superiority. Um, well, that's the thing. That's the thing about the 
air imbalance. Like even if you know nothing about military affairs, which, you know, applies to me, it's just obvious that if you don't have control of the skies and you, Russia, where Russia has an overwhelming advantage, advantage, like what chance do you really have for a major counteroffensive if your opponent dominates the skies, uh, which, you know, is the case with Russia. Like that, that's the part that never made sense. And like, I don't understand when they were planning this, how they intended to get around that. Obviously, maybe they thought they could overwhelm Russia with artillery, but even that doesn't make sense because Russia has the advantage there, as, as far as I know, from what I can tell. So militarily, it's like, was the only sort of strategy here, which is to just throw as many bodies as possible into Russia and see see if it worked like it just it seems that way given the comments of like people like Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell like Mitch McConnell said recently it's far cheaper for us in terms of American money and lives for us to fight and support like, for us to support Ukraine so is that just basically all this is it's just we're going to just sacrifice as many Ukrainians as possible and see what comes of it because otherwise I don't see what else could have been the strategy here was well, they... Zelensky saying uh, we're being very careful about not wasting lives. There is a rumor spreading around about a general mobilization and uh, one of these organizations that never fact checks all the official lies fact check that. And what they found was a major district in Kiev had put out a call for all men from age 18 to 59 to make sure wow. that they're registered for service. And then they declared that this rumor spreading on pro Russian channels was misleading uh, but the, I mean, you're going into the Obalon district of Kiev, which is heavily pop, one of the most heavily populated areas in the country, uh, calling for everyone up to age 59 to make sure they're registered. That does suggest uh, some level of desperation and that, you know, bodies are being lost unnecessarily, especially, you know, men in the prime of their life. Then you have Forbes, uh, not exactly... The gray zone, several powerful Ukrainian brigades are missing in action. This is referring to the 117th Brigade. Here's the 117th Mechanized Brigade with an AS-90 howitzer. Um, I'm not an expert. I think that that's definitely from a NATO state. I think it's from the UK. I'm sure people will correct me in the chat. But they're getting a lot. I mean, this, this brigade in particular is getting a ton of training from NATO states. They're getting a ton of wep advanced weaponry from NATO states and they're missing in action. Where is the Ukraine, Ukrainian army's 117th brigade? The answer has implications for Ukraine's 18 day old Southern counteroffensive. So far, we've just seen three, maybe four of the brigades in action alongside older Ukrainian formations. The 117th brigade is one of the missing brigades. Where it is, what it's waiting for, could speak volumes about Kiev's strategy as the counteroffensive grinds into its third week. Um, elements of the new 37th Marine Brigade outran its artillery support and lost several AMX 10RC reconnaissance vehicles. That really just speaks to the lack of uh, eyes in, in the sky. They don't actually even know where they're going. A battle group from a pair of new brigades, the 33rd Mechanized and 47th Assault Brigades, got mired in a, mount, a minefield and abandoned a couple dozen of its best tanks, fighting vehicles, and breaching vehicles. And of course, we Heard from the Russia's MOD that close to a dozen Leopard tanks have been destroyed. Uh, they're claiming something like 15,000 ca Ukrainian casualties so far. Staggering number. I don't know if it's true, yeah. but we can clearly see from, you know, you just just do a Google News search, look up counteroffensive, and you will not find any good news. Even Vladimir Zelensky himself is acknowledging that the counteroffensive, once we may be going slower than desired. Jeez. And then he, he declares that the war is not a Hollywood movie after courting Sean Penn and Orlando Bloom and all these washed up actors at his office as Putin announces, oh, Putin announces that, uh, you know, nuclear ICBMs, right? Uh, that's the Guardian for you. But, you know, the Guardian, another huge cheerleader of this operation. Yeah. Not exactly spreading the good news. You know, what you say there about Zelensky courting celebrities, that does appear to me to be his government's 
like main strategy right now. Like forget military strategy. It looks like honestly, I think they actually believe because the cult around cele- of celebrity around Zelensky is so strong that like other celebrities will be their salvation. So look, look at this headline from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it says this, Zelensky's number two turns to celebrities as well as politicians to help Ukraine. Like you're in the midst of a war that you say is for your survival. And your top Zelensky's top guy, Andre Yermak, is talking like about courting celebrities. And that that's like what this article basically says. They go on to say um, that uh, one part of Yermak's plan, Andre Yermak, Zelensky's chief of staff, is get celebrities from Latin America to visit Kiev as a raft of Western stars have done since the start of the invasion last year. And Yermak says, I'm against formal diplomacy. It's dead. <laughs> it's a new time. Soft power. It's necessary. I need results. So he's following like the State Department line of soft power, which I mean, for the State Department, that also includes like coercion and sanctions. But it also here, in the case of your, it means like propaganda operations, including attracting celebrities. Like that's what you're thinking of right now when you're facing this uh, awful war and you're sending off tens of thousands of more people to die. You're talking about celebrities as, as if they're going to save you. Uh, that really, I think, is the level of thinking um, inside the uh, Zelensky government. And look at this line. This to me, this line is so telling to me. Yermak says efforts before the war to make a deal with Russia were hamstrung by a 2015 agreement concluded under Western pressure that handed Moscow control over parts of Ukraine. So they're talking about the Minsk Accords. And it's a false statement that Minsk handed Moscow control over parts of Ukraine. Minsk handed Ukraine control over the Donbass, its own territory. All it had to do was recognize limited autonomy there, especially the cultural rights of ethnic Russians who didn't want their language being banned by the coup regime that Yermak is a part of. That's it. That's what they mean by giving, by handing Moscow control. That means basically recognizing the rights in real life. That means recognizing the rights of ethnic Russians inside of Ukraine. And what's amazing is, so this guy's saying that efforts to make a deal with Russia were hamstrung by a deal that they already reached, which was the Minsk Accords. So that's basically Yermak saying that uh, we couldn't make peace with Russia because we refused to live up to our own peace deal. That's what he's basically saying there. Imagine saying that we can't make a deal with Russia because they're insisting on us returning to a deal that we already made. That's what he's basically saying there. So it's such a revealing window into their thinking. And it gets to the point then later in the article where uh, this guy, Yermak, is talking about like he's he's he goes um, he's scrolling on social media to find other targets. One of them is Colombian <laughs> singer Maluma, who has 63 million followers on Instagram, a huge potential audience for Ukraine's message. I don't know this singer, Yermak said. It's not my music, but we need him. OK, so that's, that, that, that's what Ukraine's. One of his uh, top, uh, one of Ukraine's top officials is thinking of right now is getting Instagram influencers to come and help them and save them. It's unbelievable. Well, it's also a lot like the Western equipment. It's like their whole mission is to just court as much of the West as they can, from the soft power of Hollywood to the yeah. supposedly superior hard power of uh, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin's technology. And right now it's not making a difference. I mean, do their F-16s have AWACS in the air, supporting them, providing them with uh, you know, intelligence on the ground of what targets to hit? Or are they just flying blind? Or is that going to happen? If they have AWACS, that means US airmen will be flying in support of Ukrainian missions. If they don't have AWACS, how effective can that actually be? Do they even have the right airfields? I mean, yeah. with an F-16, it's it's difficult to to land on some short, dirty airfield. You have to sweep it clean, as I've been told by military experts. Uh, I mean, do they really need Leopard tanks? Is that really going to change the state of battle? Why is Ann Applebaum, someone who could not even fire a Beretta on <laughs> Fareed Zakaria, I doubt she's even fired a BB gun in her life. Why is she suddenly a military expert clamoring for the West to deliver all these weapons? Does she, how does she know they're going to change this, the state of play? And what is Ukraine doing economically? It's bringing in the whole 
neoliberal fourth industrial revolution without yeah. any question about what it might do to its society. It's opened itself up as a laboratory for some of the most predatory elements from BlackRock to the credit industry, uh, as we discussed several weeks ago with the Ukrainian Dia app, which, by the way, Ann Applebaum praised in her piece uh, gushing about the coming counteroffensive and how it can retake Crimea. Will there be any consequence for the pundits in Washington who've been talking up the counteroffensive like Ann Applebaum? Will they be no. called on the mat? Uh, these, I, th th this is blood on their hands. It's, it's unfathomable how many uh, people there respond. Just like in Syria, remember um, when uh, Brett McGurk, the former U.S. envoy to the anti-ISIS coalition, he said that, you know, pundits in Washington who encouraged the dirty war. He said the people like Charles Lister, he said they have blood on their hands. Uh, they got people killed. And that applies to, to Ukraine as well. It's the same crowd, obviously, because that's that's all they do is just warmonger on behalf of uh, neocon policies. But in the case of, of the state of the equipment that Ukraine's getting from the West, people like Scott Ritter say that this is like not even, this is not new equipment. This is like stuff that they've like refurbished. They've taken yeah. out of like storage, uh, and just sent in because it's equipment that, you know, according to what, like, at least what Scott says, this is stuff, equi some equipment that these countries don't even want. They don't use anymore. So they give it to Ukraine as kind of like, it's like secondhand. It's like hand-me-downs. It's not even top of the line equipment. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's, that's what someone like Scott Ritter says. Yeah. And what they want next is attackums, uh, which will, which is designed specifically to strike inside the Russian Federation. Uh, it's it that that can't go well. Uh, we had a question about addressing the counteroffensive from Lloyd Austin's five angles. I don't know uh, what that refers to, but Lloyd Austin on the fifteenth a week ago said that the counteroffensive is going to be painful and there will be losses. Uh, Mark Milley said the same thing, and well, he turned out to be a prophet, but he claims to be confident. And what I've seen from Lloyd Austin, he's just saying whatever. The Biden administration wants him to say he's kind of oh, like of a political political appointee. Millie's kind of the same. That was confirmed by the Pentagon leaks, where yeah. we learned from that, that the Pentagon privately assessed that at best, at the very best, Ukraine's uh, territorial gains would only be modest, and that's in the best case scenario. They also predicted that uh, they also warned that it would not go well. That's what they were saying privately in public. Austin was getting going before Congress and saying Ukraine has a strong chance of success. He knew that was a lie. So exactly. He was just saying what Biden wanted to hear. Millie, Millie called for negotiations last year. And then because nobody backed him up and especially in the state department, like Blinken and Sullivan, obviously Newland were against any kind of diplomacy. He just backed down. He just kind of forgot that he had, he forgot that he said that Ukraine was in the best position back last year, like in the late fall to negotiate then. And that it wouldn't be retaking any more territory. So it had to consolidate its gains then and negotiate then. He just forgot about that because he's also ultimately a political actor. Absolutely. Um, we'll see what happens after this supposed operational pause. Uh, we'll see if the 117th Mechanized Brigade materializes. Uh, there's a lot of chatter right now about Yevgeny Prigozhin, the boss of the Wagner Group making some extremely controversial comments about the Russian defense chief, Sergei Shoigu, blaming him for the invasion of Ukraine, claiming there was actually no threat to the Donetsk region, the Donetsk Republic from the Ukrainians. Uh, Pro-Ukrainian channels are going bonkers with this. Uh, so is mainstream media. And there is some rumor of a Russian attack on a Wagner base. I'm hearing all kinds of chatter. We're going to have to address this next time, but uh, because I can't quite process it right now and make sense of it's, what's what. Is it possible, is it possible that Prigozhin is engaged? Uh, pure speculation. Is it possible he's engaged in some kind of psyop to make it look as if there's disarray inside the ranks of, of, of the Russian military leadership? Because... Otherwise, I mean, especially what he was saying during Bakhmut, it just doesn't make sense to me how he could stay in that position and be so, he's so harsh when it comes to the Russian military leadership. Or is this a genuine split? Uh, in which case, yeah. 
that's real. I mean, that's really significant if if it, if he's actually being straight up. But it's hard. I to feel believe. like one of these fake Kremlinologists, like Michael Weiss, wondering, right. is this Maskarovka? Uh, <laughs> but uh, you have to wonder, it, though. It's like it's so strange. Like the stuff he's saying. It's if he's being sincere. That's. I mean, he also just accused. He said something about how he basically called out Russia's pretext for invading. He said that basically uh, Russia didn't have to go in, um, which is crazy because he was a diehard supporter of the invasion initially. So I, I just don't get what, he, what he's up to. Yeah. And a lot of people want me to say Wagner instead of Wagner, but I just feel weird saying it. I, I refer to the composer that way. Mm. I am. a. <laughs> I really enjoy Tannhauser, a people's chorus when I'm in a dark mood. Uh, but uh, and, you know. Now I'll get accused of anti-Semitism for saying I like Wagner. But <laughs> in any case, yes, it is possible. It was a PSYOP. It's possible given yeah. the record of Prigozhin declaring that his forces are pulling out of Bakhmut, that they've lost their supply lines. Um, this was followed apparently by Ukrainian reinforcement, and then they were just blasted to hell and they retreated entirely from the city. And that was when the Wagner group claimed full control of Bakhmut. So yes, there is a possibility there. I just don't want to be one of these Kremlinologist pundits. I just, I, I want to be sure of what I'm saying. Fair here. enough. Fair enough. Well, meanwhile, Let's highlight one dangerous development where, so this counteroffensive from Ukraine, it's going terribly. Everyone admits that. So what does Zelensky do? He comes out and he says this, we just had a report from our intelligence and, from our intelligence and, and the security su ser service of Ukraine. Same agency, by the way, that called for me to be banned from Twitter and asked them to hand over my info. So, you know, take that for what it is. Intelligence has received information that Russia is considering a scenario of a terrorist attack on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, a terrorist attack with radiation leakage. They have prepared everything for this. So this warning from Zelensky comes right as they're getting their asses kicked in this counteroffensive. And yeah. I don't know if this is, I mean, at best, I think this could just be an effort to distract people from how awfully the counteroffensive is going for them. At worst, and this is just a possibility, this is an act of projection and that possibly Ukraine is maybe crazy enough to do something like this and then blame it on Russia. I really hope that's not the case, but I mean, I'm hoping that this is just propaganda. They're trying to distract from uh, how badly the offensive is going and they're not actually putting this out there in preparation for something that they might do because the okay, idea that, that relates to, sorry, go ahead. Well, it just also, again, this comes back to it's Russia that controls that nuclear plant. And we've been, there's been this farce going on for, I don't know, almost a year now, maybe more, where Russia controls the plant and the media reports that the plant is being shelled. But the media always, like the US media always says, it's unclear who's shelling the plant, but it's likely Russia. So basically, according to the narrative, we're supposed to believe Russia is shelling a nuclear plant that its own forces are controlling. And this is, you know, the latest part of that farce that, that we're supposed to just accept. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's kind of, uh, it would be nice if the IAEA would clear that up. They seem, they're starting to remind me of the OPCW. Here's uh, <laughs> yeah. Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham, we got to fight this war down to the last Ukrainian. And Richard Denang Dick Blumenthal. <laughs> I'm not, he's not a member of my family, unfortunately, because I could at least like say something about this uh, at some reunion or something i don't know we don't actually have family reunions but they have a senate resolution saying any event in ukraine which allegedly results in a dispersal of radioactive contaminants should be cause for invoking article 5 of the nato treaty and going to mm. war against russia and belarus which has now uh received tactical russian nuclear weapons so that would be a nuclear exchange if belarus was threatened in an existential way here's that resolution these are these are psychopaths who hold powerful positions as Republican and Democrat in the Senate. They're calling for essentially they're, they're inviting a false flag operation around yeah. the Zaporozhia nuclear plant. 
which was already threatened by the destruction of the Kahovka Dam, which feeds its uh, coolant with um, its 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 coolant uh, capacity with water. Uh, this is an invitation for a false flag and a World War Three. And why is Lindsey Graham and Richard Blumenthal, why are they so hostile also to this move of Russia to put nukes in Belarus? Because they know, they know that Russia is not going to use those nukes, uh, unless, of course, Russia is attacked with nukes first. They know that Putin actually is setting the stage for negotiations. So when you talk to the U.S. and NATO, Russia gets something out of withdrawing its nukes from Belarus. That will be Russia's one of Russia's concessions. Russia is setting the stage for that. And what Russia wants, and this was laid out in their draft treaties that they, that they put to, you, to you, the U.S. and NATO in December 2021, a few months before the invasion, Russia wants the rollback of NATO weaponry that threatens Russia, especially these U.S. missile sites in Poland and Romania. The so Aegis putting, systems, the dual-use Aegis systems. Exactly, which, which the U.S. insists are to defend Europe from Iran which everyone knows is the biggest joke in the world. So that's what Putin's doing here. Putting these nukes in Belarus, this will allow, and the, whenever negotiations happen, this will allow the West to say, we got this concession from Russia and that we got the nukes out of Belarus. That, that, that's what that's for. It's like the Jupiter missiles in Turkey, which yeah. precipitated the Cuban Missile Crisis, where Khrushchev then retaliated by putting nuclear missiles in Cuba, which yeah. led to the withdrawal of the Jupiter missiles from Turkey. Russia has, and then, then the Soviet Union, they have a strategic depth and they have the ability to use deterrence to enforce it, to enforce their sphere of influence. And what these psychopaths like Lindsey Graham and Richard Blumenthal believe is that Russia is not entitled to any sphere of influence at all. And yeah. it must completely be pushed back until Russian forces are reinforcing the suburbs of Moscow as they did during World War II, also when they were fighting against German tanks. Let's listen to Dr. Strangelove, Lindsey Graham. Uh, Senator Blumenthal, and I want to put everybody in this body and this Congress on notice that the threat of a use of a nuclear device by Russia is real. And the best way to deter it is this is the red line all over again to give them clarity, the Russians, as to what happens if they do that. They will be in a war with NATO. Poland is at immediate risk if the use of tactical nuclear weapons or destruction of a nuclear power plant causes radiation to spread, as almost certainly it would, causing significant human harm. This is not a kind of reckless or panicky resolution. It's based yes, it is. on fact and science. And it is meant science? to send a message. It's based on science. I love that. Where did, we, where did he get that language from? To Vladimir Putin and even more directly to his military. Right. They will be destroyed. They will be eviscerated if they use tacti tactical nuclear weapons or if they destroy a nuclear plant in a way that threatens there we go. NATO nation. There we go. So that certainly uh, bolsters the argument here that there's a planning for a false flag if, if that's the yep. warning being put out there. I mean, I, I really hope it's not the case. It's so, by the way, it's so fitting that the replacement for John McCain as Lindsey Graham's like neocon buddy um, sidekick is a Democrat because John McCain's ideology is totally taken over the Democratic Party. So it's so fitting that Richard Blumenthal is playing John McCain's role and even more fitting that Blumenthal, you know, like McCain served in Vietnam, was captured there, uh, really played that up. Blumenthal, his relation to Vietnam is he lied about his service in Vietnam, right? That's kind of his claim to fame. He like, he told, he, 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 he like he played up his role, I think, in, in Vietnam. Isn't isn't that kind of what he's known for? Yeah, he claimed he had got a purple heart that he never got. Right. There we go. Yeah. He was wounded. So, yeah. 
So what a fitting replacement for John McCain as as Lindsey Graham's uh, neocon buddy. Well, yeah, John McCain's military legend was trumped up too, but he did suffer enormously in the Hanoi Hilton. What, you know, you got, this is the perfect portrait of the Beltway Uniparty. You got a Republican and a Democrat. They disagree yeah. strongly about abortion. Um, but, and they support strongly, they stand united in favor of a post-birth abortion for humanity through nuclear weapons uh and they're both raking in the military contractor bucks um you know ukrainians are suffering and ukrainian men are suffering and dying in this counteroffensive. the beltway bandits that fund the campaigns of lindsey graham and richard blumenthal are not suffering they're doing very well we've got a piece coming out pretty soon showing how which will show how well they're doing we have done an unofficial audit a mm. lot of the expenses that we, the U.S. taxpayer, are covering in Ukraine. And it's, co it's going right back here to some of the most corrupt, criminal-minded contractors you can imagine. This is sick. I mean, that's why we have to keep talking about it. It's sick. And it, it is, it's, it's like Vietnam in a way, just the, the folly of it, the lies, the, uh, the, 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 the best and brightest designing this catastrophe. The difference is you don't have working class American boys going over and coming back in, in body bags or with their legs blown off or they're, you know, or driven insane, hooked on heroin. We just, this is the future of warfare for the U S and Taiwan is next. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of uh, what we're getting for our money here, the U S just found some more money. It's a miracle. The Pentagon announcing that because of an accounting error, they freed up another $6.2 billion for the Ukraine proxy war. <laughs> from, um, some announcements earlier this year. During the department's regular oversight of our execution of presidential drawdown authority for Ukraine, we discovered inconsistencies in equipment valuation for Ukraine. In a significant number of cases, services used replacement costs rather than net book value, thereby overestimating the value of the equipment drawn down from U.S. stocks and provided to Ukraine. Once we discovered this misvaluation, the comptroller reissued guidance on March 31st, clarifying how to value equipment in line with the financial management regulation and DOD policy to ensure we use the most accurate of accounting methods. Yes. confirmed that for FY23, the final calculation is $3.6 billion. And for FY22, it is $2.6 billion for a combined total of $6.2 billion. Bam. There we go, everybody. Our it's, bad. It's, we just It's like when you thought you like like had some like money wad in a sock and you lost it when you were a kid. You'd like it was your allowance or you'd been doing yard work and then you find it like under <laughs> your bed a, a year later and you're just so happy. Yeah. Um, and and it's so nice of them to give back, you know, or and, and of the Biden administration to give back to the American people during such economic hard times by allowing the Pentagon to just freely spend that money on more equipment for Ukraine. And I, I think we could, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, let's, I think we got to move on. Just one more thing. Cause this happened yeah. this week. This ha I mean, there's so much Ukraine news and there's so much we're not going to get to, unfortunately, but we have to get to this. Somebody's got to do it. Putin this week presented this document, which is, he says was a copy of the peace agreement that Ukraine signed last spring, last April. And this is the latest piece of evidence that there was a deal reached between Ukraine and Russia in the early weeks of the war that could have ended it. The basic bargain was Ukraine would commit to neutrality. It would commit to limits on its armed forces and its weaponry that could be used to threaten Russia and the Donbass. And in exchange, Russia would withdraw to its pre-invasion lines. And the issue of Crimea would basically be uh, left unresolved for, for it, it would be frozen. So Russia would, would keep Crimea. So Putin says this, that this is the document that, and he says that Ukraine signed it and he, he showed a signature. I haven't seen anybody argue that this document is a fake. Um, and it comes after a whole series of other sources, all of them NATO sources, sources close to Zelensky, the former Israeli prime minister, the Turkish foreign minister, and Fiona Hill speaking to US officials. All of them have said the same thing that there was a deal reached between the two sides. And, you know, a few of those sources, the Zelensky sources, 
and Naftali Bennett, the former Israeli prime minister, and the Turkish foreign minister, all of them said the West blocked the deal. And so Putin now producing for the first time a copy of the agreement. I didn't see any reporting on this in the establishment media in the West. It just goes over everyone's heads. It's, it's deemed unimportant. And it just underscores that all of this carnage could have been avoided had the U.S. and NATO and its far-right allies, allies in Ukraine just been willing to accept the, the rights of uh, ethnic Russians inside Ukraine and accept some limitations on NATO, including, in this case, just keeping Ukraine neutral. So not expanding NATO into Ukraine. And that couldn't happen. They wanted to use Ukraine instead to bleed Russia. And this is the result we're seeing now. Well, actually, and this is kind of my fault, but uh, we asked the State Department about that, the legitimacy of that document. Mm. Through our Washington correspondent, Liam Cosgrove, who's just been doing the Lord's work in the Pentagon and State Department or the atheist Lord's work, depending on what you believe. Um, and he asked, um, what's his name? Patel. Um, I forget the spokesperson's name, spokesman's name, um, but he asked him. It wasn't him. It was actually an African reporter who first started to emphasize that there was this negotiation put on the table by Putin, that Putin brought it up at the St. Petersburg Economic Conference. And she said, you know, it's very important. This war is hurting Africa very badly. Um, what about this? You know, what about this document? Is it true? Is it real? No, no. She wasn't saying, is it true? She just mentioned it. And then Liam followed up and said, do you know that this, if this document, do you agree that it's real? Like, do you agree that it exists? Are you saying it's a lie? And Patel just completely deflected. It wasn't clear if he was claiming that he didn't know it existed or that he didn't believe it was real or not. He just deflected completely and moved on. Um, yeah, whenever, yeah, whenever I've written the State Department and the National Security Council about this, they've never denied that there was a deal reached. Uh, they've never denied it. They just, and they issue a generic response that we enc we encourage diplomacy blah 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 but they never deny because it it's true there was i mean so many sources have confirmed it now and the fact that the media if putin was lying the washington post new york times will be all over it reporting on this putin says there was a deal reach he even has a document that's a that, that's russian disinformation no it's true yeah. so they have to ignore it yeah um it's true and what it means is that the West needed this war to go on as long as possible, the collective West, and especially the U.S. As Tony Blinken said, there are many economic opportunities after the detonation of Nord Stream. And as we can see, there's been a big boon in the arms industry and with the Beltway Bandit contractors in Washington. And I think that it's really the Pentagon and Tony Blinken who's involved in business with these same forces through West exec advisors, which Victoria Newland was also involved with. She was also the founder and president of CNAS, Center for New American Security, which was funded by the arms industry. You could go on and on, but they have a vested interest in this war going on as long as possible. Mm -hmm.